when you meet somebody who's under a bridge or out home, you know, most likely that adult was homeless when they were a kid. This is not a new thing. So if you can help a family really get out of poverty, you are becoming a prevention You're breaking for that the cycle. You're breaking that cycle. So I think if we can go intensive, and I believe it takes us all together. I mean, the mentorship piece is key. Getting involved, becoming a mentor, seeing the world through their eyes. If you want to start living equity, diversity, and inclusion, become a mentor. This is Startup Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Jill Bowman, head of Imagine LA, a nonprofit focused on breaking the cycle of family homelessness and poverty. Her organization is certainly not the first to attempt to tackle these problems, and she's realistic about the need for other organizations to do their part as well. But Imagine LA is having a real impact on the lives of over 200 families in the greater Los Angeles area, helping what are often families led by a single parent get back on their feet when it comes to financial and emotional stability. So listen in as we cover everything from why domestic violence is a huge driver of family homelessness, how she plans to scale Imagine LA to different parts of the state, and her plans to build livable mixed communities with houses and retail shops to alleviate the housing crisis we're currently experiencing. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Jill, the CEO of Imagine LA. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, tell I'm everyone. I'm super glad to be here. I love the concept of the show and having been a serial entrepreneur, I'm, I'm all game. Yeah, Jill's been in the game for a long time, her whole life. <laughs> and now she's, she's transitioned to Imagine LA. Tell everyone a little bit about what, what your, your company is working on, what your nonprofit is trying to do. Well, Imagine LA is like completely dedicated to ending family homelessness and poverty. And I want you to hear both of those words, homelessness and poverty. When you're talking about generational homelessness, the cycle of poverty, you've got to deal with the poverty piece. It's the biggest underlying cause for homelessness, especially in the family setting. So we're trying to do both. Most people just try to get people off the street and keep them in housing. And we're trying to say, nope, let's get that a whole family on their way, get, get them financially independent. And what made you passionate about this? Obviously, it's an emerging problem, I think, in the United States. I used to live in San Francisco when I was in tech probably, I mean, six, seven years ago, and it was just a function. It was everywhere. It was it's all over It's become synonymous streets. with yeah. the problem. Yeah, obviously, what do they call it? Skid Row. People always yeah, know, and think they of Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, and they had up in uh, San, San Francisco. Francisco. My two, like, passion issues involved in middle school and high school, one was women's rights and women's empowerment, and then the other was homelessness. And it wasn't until 2006, six seven when family homelessness actually became a thing. It's still not a thing people really talk about because you don't really see it. It's sort of the hidden homelessness. But in 2000, I think it was six, there was an article in the paper that said there are 8,000 homeless families in Los Angeles. And I'm like, what? And what most people don't think about it again, hidden homeless, is the majority of these families are actually single-headed. There's 86% of Imagine LA's families that we work with are headed by uh, single moms, a single parent, and some single dads who are amazing. So it was the collision or the intersection of my two issues you know it was a women's empowerment issue and you know this deep-seated no one in the United States should be homeless this is crazy probably based on my faith just compassion issue so they came together and I was asked to get involved with Imagine LA which the original vision of it was there's 8,000 homeless families in Los Angeles, there's 8,000 places of worship. It doesn't matter what 
kind, couldn't we come alongside these families and, and help them not only get out of homelessness, but get out of poverty? And I was asked to be on the initial board. They didn't have, and I was asked because nobody on this initial group of do-gooders had ever started or run anything. And I'd never started or run a nonprofit, but I'd built a couple of businesses and um, so I could ask the questions. And pretty soon it became clear that the people that thought they could run this couldn't. They resigned. They asked me to step in. I did it interim for three months, and it's 14 years later. Wow. Uh, and I've never done another business this long. And so when you first got into the business, what were some of the things that you learned that were very surprising to you? And so you mentioned poverty. And so is it a function of, like, it, in my head, I can do quick math, right? So if I have, let's say, a, fi- a minimum wage job, and I'm working eight hours a day because that's all I can work because that's what my employer is going to max me out at, it becomes very difficult to find a place to live in a city like San Francisco or or Los Angeles or any major city, let's say. Yeah, you can't, and there's benefits, but they're tricky, Mm -hmm. and it's just, it's a nightmare. Is that how it starts? Yeah, and then something happens. Okay. Like, like people are, are they're doubled up or they're they figured out some kind of a living arrangement. Something happens. And when you say something happens, is something it, like, is it a, like health, a car accident. Okay. A health car accident. Lose okay. your job. Just a relatively minor thing that disrupts a paycheck or a benefit, and then rent, eviction in your car, couch surfing, uh, that sort of. Thing. It's incredibly precarious, especially as a single parent. When you meet them, how long have they been struggling to either reach out to somebody? Like, at what point does someone also feel comfortable asking for help, right? I'm sure that's a part of it. So first, they probably see, maybe if they have friends and family in the area, they try to figure it out. They realize yeah. these situations aren't working. They could be unhealthy. They could be abusive. Right. I wanted to actually say, uh, in terms of the event, mm-hmm. is domestic violence is a huge driver in family uh, homelessness. Uh, If you've by any chance watched the the relatively new show, The Maid, it is spot on of what happens. And then what the person that's run away with their kids has to navigate. It's incredible. It's so hard. That's a great show. Uh, it's a phenomenal It's show. a really good show. Uh, it's so good. And, and it's, she keeps running. She keeps solving the problem, but it's also like, it's like whack-a-mole. It's, it's a whack-a-mole. Something else emerges. And let's put a pin in that because mm-hmm. how they show you what's going on with the social benefit system in our country is the most well-researched. It's I'm constantly, when I'm watching TV about our issue, I'm like, oh God. I wish they knew what they were talking about. But the maid is spot on. They did their homework. But so one of the events can be domestic violence. So usually, so when we started looking at the problem, like, okay, these were a bunch of do-gooders that wanted to come alongside families. But where do they get them? Where, where are they in their journey? Well, step back. I'm an entrepreneur. You guys are entrepreneurs. What's happening in the market? Like, What happens, okay, people get homeless, they finally, after help, they end up in a shelter, they're there for a while, they stabilize families. It's more of small apartments or large bedrooms rather than like the cots, okay? Okay? You know, just visually, it's more, it's a little bit more human and people can stay longer. More recently, because it's so bad, it's become motel rooms. There are thousands of families in L.A. that have now been, with COVID and everything, and the lack of housing, have been in a motel room for over two years. Can you It's, like, really bad. But so they're there, and they're basically waiting, whether they're at a place or in a motel room, and they're getting some basic, making sure their food and shelter and basic stuff's happening. Very hard to navigate getting a new job in those situations. Very hard. It's really survival kind of mode, right? And very trauma. Trauma, trauma, trauma. Then they eventually get into some kind of permanent housing. They get a Section 8 voucher or there's a special building or something, and they get in there. Well, usually wherever that is is far. 
like they fell out of housing in the valley and they are moving to South LA because that's the only place they can find an apartment that will take Section 8. And the place that was taking care of them doesn't have funding to keep in touch with them and so forth in their new home. And they get there, and if they have one more event, guess what happens? They go back in. So that's the gap that we identified when we took a look at the system at that point. And we realized that we needed to come alongside the family as they were getting into housing and help the kids find their schools, help the, the parents get acclimated with all the services that were there, help them then find a job. But it was only when we looked in the gap in the market. And there was no government funding available for that. And when people tried to throw some government funding at us, they were telling us what to do. And we were like, doesn't seem quite like what we should do. <laughs> so we just started working with families, about two, three families our first year in 2008. Now we're up to over 200 families a year, and we're starting to work with whole buildings of families where we're on site. Where we get the families is from, referred from all those shelters, right? And there's now a coordinated entry system for LA city and county that refers families not the best well-oiled machine, so we still tend to go directly to to the shelters, the transitional housing. Yeah, you've been at this since 2008. How have things changed since then from your perspective in terms of both, you said there was no government assistance offered at the beginning unless it came with checks and balances sort of system. Mm -hmm. And then also, how have you seen the progression of the homeless population as it is today. I mean, I can think we can all agree it's worse than it was in 2008. Yeah. And how have you seen that change in a way that maybe you see solutions that aren't being offered? Maybe you see things that we can do differently. But from a big picture perspective, what are your thoughts on how we can, as as a community, as a state, as a country? Because I don't think anyone's going to ever get rid of all homelessness in the Mm -hmm. United States. That's not the issue. It's the issue of making it as good as we possibly can and and managing it where possible. Mm -hmm. So how do you view the best outcome for that scenario? First of all, yes, homelessness has gotten a lot worse. And particularly, it's flowing out of the recession and the economics, but it's also a lot about our cost of living here in Los Angeles and the lack of housing period. You know, people can talk all day long about drugs or da-da-da-da-da, but really we've got a supply and demand problem. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go down like what do I think all the, you know, the solutions are, but mostly we've got to figure out how to house people temporarily and then get them into housing and build the housing both the temporary and the long-term, as fast as we possibly can um, with trying to streamline all the costs associated with that. It's just absurd. There's so much technology now that can make it faster. But I'm going to focus on families because I feel like, and why I've been in it for so long, is family homelessness has grown even more than regular. So we haven't had a homeless count for two years, but from 2019 to 2020, single adult house, whether that portion grew, whether you're talking about the city or the county, between 13 and 16, 17%. Family homelessness grew by 49, 45%. I mean, wow. like, come on. How big are these families on average? Is it four or five? Is it three? Uh, 3.5 is the average. Parent, two kids. You know, parent, two kids, um, two parent, five kids. I mean, it ranges. But how do you end a family's homelessness? It's how do you end a family's homelessness so they're never homeless again, so they're out of poverty? And what can we do to stop the flow of more families into the homeless system? Because you know, we're housing and doing all of this, but it's actually flowing faster than we're picking it up on the other side. So 
the main thing is that you, we've got to come alongside and equip families to build economic mobility and to actually deal with their trauma and make sure the kids are, are and everybody's doing well from a wellness point of view, whether it's mental health, whether that's regular checkups, it's all of those things. But it's dealing with the two generational. Is it job specific? Is it a function of... Now, you know what's really interesting? So imagine like we do case management, which is, you know, with MSW, with master social workers, professional people that come alongside the family. And they sort of help figure out where they are and, and help the families think about where they want to go and do. And then, so that's one piece, is just getting people heard and seen. And then, at, then there's another piece about bringing social capital and bringing other people to come alongside. And that's, we do that through mentorship, where every member of the family over five gets a mentor. And they really, they become their biggest, each person's biggest fan. And, you know, think about boys without fathers involved and, you know, and somebody who's caring about if you're going to school every day other than your mom. And remember, a lot of these families have been completely isolated. That's how they got homeless. Their family units and their ties have not. So start building a village around the family. And then it's not about just a job, to answer your question. It's about creating economic mobility. So after 11 years of work with this, we're looking at our families. They got jobs. Their kids are doing well in school. Everybody's healthy, but they're not getting out of poverty. We're not really doing it. So we decided to go deep and look into living wage jobs, not a job, a living wage job. What kind of job can they do that's high demand, they can be trained in in less than a year, and be able to to start off out. And is that, does that have a number, the living wage? Depends on the number of kids you have and how their ages. Okay. So the absolute minimum minimum is like 18, okay. but it can be $25. But, eat, but that's only if you have subsidized housing. You, know, you do the math. Without subsidized housing, it's sort of a no-win no matter what yeah. with a single parent. So what jobs did you find that met this qualification? We have nine different pathways. Some are in healthcare. Some are starting with an apprenticeship program at UPS. You know, so in transportation, we have um, some in tech. It's called uh, Code Talk. Is a is the provider. There's there's nine different ones. And what we did was we actually went deep into the data, into where were job demands and what were pathways that are family or head of households could actually do. And then we did focus groups with them. And, you know, what did they want to do? Because if they don't want to do it, it's not going to happen. So it's not just job, living wage jobs. It's also childcare. And it's also what we call financial fitness. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, and then it's also navigating the social safety net, which as it is right now, is a great big black box of benefits that are coming from federal, state, local, like, you know, Department of Agriculture, Department, the Housing Department, like there's literally 14 different kinds of benefits that families have to navigate. And things happen when their wages, all of a sudden, as their wages go up, something falls away. So there's all this fear around actually making money and trying to get ahead. And we've only found this by partnering with USC, by going into the deep research, and now we've created the algorithms that can, so people can actually see what are going on. And Imagine is about to embark, well, we've already started the coding, on creating uh, an app for case managers and families to actually navigate these benefits so they can help them get out of poverty as opposed to feel like they're playing whack-a-mole. I remember we had on the uh, the former mayor of West Hollywood on the podcast, and she... Abby? No, Lindsay. Lin Lindsay oh, Lindsay. Okay. Lindsay Horvath. And we were talking about rent control. So as a real estate developer, I don't do residential for a number of reasons. From just like if I'm looking at a financial, just a pro forma, it doesn't pencil. And so it makes it very difficult 
to solve the housing problem unless there's some sort of new market tax credits or some sort of tax credits and then you're only building section eight and it has really nothing to do with desire developers are simple where they're just following the carrot uh, the hard part is who's going to subsidize the cost of construction which is just skyrocketing it becomes difficult it becomes difficult to make it work and so when i was asking the mayor about housing she was telling me that even though she's a mayor in west hollywood she can't even afford to live here and she has two jobs and so you know it's really eye-opening from that perspective recently west hollywood went on to there's the highest minimum wage in west hollywood in the whole country it's here it depends on what you do specifically it starts at i think 1540 depending on the job and it goes as high as 1785 something like that for for the minimum wage depending yeah, on what you but do it's still not a living wage and that's and so when you were saying this i was just thinking but it's still not a living wage and then it reminded me of the conversation we had with you know how can you be the mayor of a town of a city and you can't even afford to live in here it's a real problem there's also a lot of talks i've gone to around economics and it's just it's it's kind of as simple as you put it we're around housing it's just a housing crisis it's it's supply and demand and the inland empire has seemed to figure this out and so they're thriving because they've created so many jobs but what has led the growth of jobs was not jobs or industry it was the housing it's it's the more housing you have the more people can flourish and they'll move there and by default they'll end up working there and creating industry and so it's always housing that leads the surge and in la we're just at this massive deficit at the moment and i just don't see a way out on the housing side in that vein though we just, as a state, we eliminated the R1 zoning and mm -hmm. enabled people to build ADUs, duplexes, triplexes, instead of just single family homes. Yeah. Do you foresee down the line, 10, 20 years, that no. playing a factor? Zero. I, I, zero. That won't make, that just gets the rich richer, frankly. In Nashville, this is something I want to ask you about. Nashville did this study where they basically recognized they were creating poverty. And so what did that mean? That mean That meant they were building Section 8 housing, affordable housing, and then the people that would go to, that would live in these areas, these counties, would end up going to these schools that were underserved. And basically, it's like they live in not so good settings. Then they get educated in also worse settings. And so it was creating, they basically did a study and it was, they were creating poverty, is what they found out. And so Nashville ended up moving to this new model and they're just starting. It's like, it may, may be opened recently where it's, it's, it's mixed income housing with an amazing charter school. And they're an earshot of each other and everyone's a different color everyone's a different background everyone's a different race and the education is top tier love it and it's an experiment we, we got to tour the facilities and pretty amazing honestly the teachers were so amazing uh, and you knew they had their work cut out for them there was no it const like as much as they loved it and you could feel the love that they had for it it was work it was real work some of these people weren't coming from the best backgrounds and so they're just as much as they are teacher, they're psychologist, therapist, mom, dad, all of it. But in that, it was an interesting angle from a real estate perspective of does this mixed income housing work? It certainly doesn't lead to the problem of a bad school system. That, that It solves for that for sure. And so it was almost like education becomes a big part of it too. The one real estate slash community solution that I've seen that I'm actually, I went, wait, I want to help you. This is good. It's called Livable Neighborhoods. And it's headed by Lindsay Sturman, who uh, was the brains behind uh, Larchmont Charter and all of that. And I think we can all agree that Los Angeles is a collection of neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And if you're- I'm if learning you, that as someone who's new to LA. Yeah, People it's don't a leave collection a, and, <laughs> a circle, and bubble. And each- each one has its little magic, yeah. and basically their concept is to take these neighborhoods and build up the neighborhoods, but not in a way that's high-rises or creating projects, but to create mixed-income housing. Basically, if we think about um, like Larchmont Boulevard or Westwood Boulevard, where they're basically one or two stories where you've got a retail on the bottom and you've got a, an owner and saying to them, we've got these different plans where you can create a 10-unit building, two, three, four stories, but still low on this, getting it not to be more like Larchmont Boulevard, not, you know, 
and creating common parking areas so you can take away the parking equation and create both equity, so buying and renting, mixed, again, income, and doing things with transportation to major hub lines, you know, whether it's the metro or bus lines or otherwise, to basically create walking, neighbor, walking, biking neighborhoods. And if you just do the simple math, you do three or four of these and you can create 60,000 units. But it's low rise. It's creating neighborhoods. It's going to the person that owns that building and helping them finance to do this. They don't have to sell, but they're going to get more income. And it's not too hard to see, to start putting these all over the place, at Lamert Park, different parts of West LA, out in the valley, in Pasadena, you know, like all over, where you can get to that four or 500,000 unit deficit that we have without thinking about swaths of land, huge tax, you know, like yeah. in it, at least for me, you know, we talked about earlier before all this, how being an entrepreneur or being, trying to think innovatively is about connecting dots and, and seeing things. And I feel like this is connecting the dots of how, neighborhoods are so key to what Imagine LA is. We aren't a city-centric sprawl. It's like lumpy pancake batter. You know, it's kind of all poured out. And um, I don't know. I think it's a pretty cool idea. One of the things you mentioned earlier was your frustration with the 14 government entities and agencies. It was kind of this like murky water for people to wade through. Mm -hmm. So do you do you feel like it would be better served if there was just one agency versus the 14 that there currently are? Would they be better served combined into one to streamline the process of navigating through subsidies and grants for the, the homeless and, and those experiencing poverty? Well, maybe in the long term. But in the short term, if we can just get them in the same room and start showing them exactly, you know, we now have these things and we can start showing them what's actually happening and use, I mean, the vision of, we're calling it the social benefit calculator, is that you can show them what would happen if you tweaked your policy, you know, what would that do and would it make it less of a creeks and valleys and, you know, like a rocky road and more of what I would call like a springboard out of poverty rather than a sticky spider web, right? What I think it's showing people what everybody has pretty well intended. And there's, I think there's just so much bureaucracy and so, you know, there's huge engines behind these things, but they are policies that can be tweaked and can be modified. But you know, it's very hard for them as silos to see the effects of their work unless it's it's done. I mean, the way that we're looking at it, it's like we're literally bringing all those, we've got the Federal Reserve Bank involved who actually has a whole database of all these policies all over the country. And, you know, like how, how it's helping everybody navigate. When we think about entrepreneurs, oftentimes we're looking at a bunch of different things and trying to make it simple, trying to make it easy for a consumer, trying to figure that out. And I see that as what we're going to be trying to do with all these different things, like all these, think of like cottage industries and wanting to bring them together um, and have them pointing in the same direction and helping families, not hurting them. What do you guys view as like your, your success metric? So if we were just making this about entrepreneurial, like what, where are you you know, 14 years in here, at what point are you saying, okay, this is, you know, this is what, I don't want to say the end of the journey, but at least like the completion of the end of the journey looks like, or maybe you've learned something where it's never enough to some extent. You just have to keep, you have to stay with them. Well, I think the good news about the Imagine Lay approach, which is this case management plus mentorship and then plus the economic mobility is it, they're geared towards a pretty intensive experience for about two years and getting people on a path 
And the families, the mentor, people choose to graduate. I mean, they're like, we got this. And the, often the mentors stay involved and we're always there. You know, we're family forever. So we'll like during the pandemic, thank God, because we helped a lot of our alumni. But we're seeing that this works. The issue is we've been doing it one family at a time. How can we do it in a scaling way? So the economic mobility plan and that program, we're just trying to expand it. And if we can put that together and start offering it more wholesale to other, lots of other agencies, then you start seeing it. And the metrics is easy. Are they in poverty or are they out? Are the kids flourishing in school? Or are they not? It's really um, not that hard. And we've been tracking it and it's easy to see. The circular path of homelessness and poverty, that cycle, especially in black and brown communities, has been going on for m many generations. And so it, I said it sounds simple, but there's lots of work there. And Chris Coe, who's you know, one of the big guys at United Way, once said when we were on a panel together, he said, Jill, when you meet somebody who's under a bridge or out home, you know, most likely that adult was homeless when they were a kid. This is not a new thing. So if you can help a family really get out of poverty, you are becoming a prevention You're breaking for that. The cycle. You're breaking that cycle. So I think if we can go intensive, and I believe it takes us all together. I mean, the mentorship piece is key. Getting involved, becoming a mentor, seeing the world through their eyes. If you want to start living equity, diversity, and inclusion, become a mentor. Do you partner with like the big brothers, big sisters, or do you guys have your own? Mentor? We have our own mentor. You have your own. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, we have our own training. Yeah, I would imagine background it's, it's checks different. and yeah. all the different things, and we guide and we, you know, we've built that over time. Most mentoring organizations, whether it's Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or others, usually are just dealing with one, you know, one kid and one adult, or one an, one adult and another adult. We're dealing with a, this metrics of a family where we have, you know, one mentor for every member of the family over five and we're coordinating that so as far as I know there aren't other people sort of doing that right. but the amount of love and confidence and resources and opportunities that that brings to the family it sort of is like um it's gas it's fuel it's part of the magic um, they're learning a new job and going into this new thing and they have all these questions and they just want to, they don't want to do it. It's hard. You know, uh, their kid's sick, they're this, that, but if they've got that mentor team and the other people cheering them on, you know, stepping up so they can show up, then they can get on that path. So it's, 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 it's more than it's human. Yeah. It's humans helping humans. I had a big brother growing up with the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. Oh, I and love that. And it was that. like so amazing. And then yeah. when I was in college and after college, most of my friends were Jewish. And so they, they signed me up to be a Jewish big brother. Oh, I love that. <laughs> but it was working with people with disabilities. And so we ended, I did that for three, four years when I was living in Boston. And we would all do it together. So it was like me and three friends that would all just do it together. And uh, my guy was Eli. But it was... It was special. You know, I think receiving it is one thing. And I don't, I don't like for people listening, I think it is important to mentor. It's, it's a pretty selfless thing, but you're going to make a lifelong friend. Like I'm still in touch with my big brother. And I love that. And, you know, I'm like a full grown adult here and, <laughs> you know, and he has a daughter and it's a, it's a, a really amazing, the relationship that has spawned from that. And I, I almost hate to say it's a mentorship because it really just became a friendship. Yep. As, you know what I it mean? Does. It wasn't it, like, he wasn't there to give me advice you know, although he like maybe taught me like what baseball glove to buy or something like that. Right. Yeah. But it wasn't, he wasn't a parent. No. And that was amazing because he was just there to, no, to he be was a, Yeah. A he was your buddy. Yeah. That's your all bud. he was. Yeah. Was so and that's, good. you know, I think that's companion. You can call it lots of different things. And, uh, one huge area is, especially when we got youth that are in the high school stage, middle school, high school, and, and, showing them about 
college or trade. We're not hell bent on uh, you know the college path for everyone. We're you know f- helping find whatever path really makes sense for him. I love that you mentioned uh, Jewish Big Brothers Big Sisters. They actually totally stepped up when we were designing our mentorship program. They leaned in with us and you know helped us with logic models and because we went out and said you know like to these those organizations we because the best poverty breaking statistics that are out there still is around mentorship i mean the the stats is are there so we went to them and we said hey have you tried this with families not just one-on-one they're like oh no we you know we can barely we're just can do what we can do but we'll love to try to help you. And part of what they said is, if you're going to deal with families, you really need that case management piece. You really need somebody that really understands mental health, physical health, trauma, all the stuff, because there's so much in the whole family system. And in fact, they even said, to, I had, you know, we did all these interviews. I had so many people that said, my one rate limiting factor of being a mentor, which I was one of the most, was the fact that I couldn't deal with the whole family. It was just my mentee. That was part of our, when we were just deciding to do the mentorship part, that was part of, you know, we heard those voices. Yeah. I think from, from my perspective, like this is the problem I've been solving for myself for my whole life. It's, it's like when you move to this country, so I was born in Peru and you move here, you couldn't point to a successful Peruvian. Couldn't do it wasn't on TV, wasn't in sports, wasn't anywhere. And so it was almost like you look around and you start to think, nope, nobody's successful or nobody mm. is your, whatever your metric of success is at a very young age. And then what was galvanizing for me was, okay, I'm going to go be that guy. And what mentorship taught me on both ends, receiving it and giving it was some people just need a window and you're the window. And whether they want to so look through well it said. or not, doesn't matter but you've given them another color in like the Crayola box. And that is so huge. It's, it's like a seed and it can be whatever it wants to be, but it's so huge and it means so much. And that's what I've learned personally on both sides of it. I love that. It's a window. To another world. To another world, but also framed with safety. Yeah. In, in a way. Yeah. You and know, if you like, think about like simple things, like my big brother yeah. would come pick me up in a truck. I'd never been in a truck. It was a green Ford F-150. We'd, <laughs> go, we'd go fishing, freshwater. I'd <gasps> never put a worm on a hook. And I'm like, why am I doing this? But I got to do that. Window, right? He had this fascination with making wheat toast and putting honey on it. I'd never experienced that. And so it's like little things that to him, I'm sure were, this is him living his life. But to me, it was like, Oh, we were going to Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts. Had never even heard of this place. Taking roads I'd never seen. Hanging out with someone who lives in a totally different world than I do. And that was that that was it. Like just that was enough. You know, the fact that he was cool and funny and all that other stuff, that was just a bonus, but that was it. And then like I would have dinner with his family and like getting to they were Polish and so like pierogies were a thing. And so all these little things, you know, and it just kinda like snowballs, but you really get a window into how other people live and it's really interesting. Because when you're stuck, and I can imagine this in poverty, your world is so small. And and, 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 and what do you see? And what do you, right. exactly, those four walls are it. Feels yep. pretty enclosed. Yeah, and so I think, you know, just that, I can imagine that escape being so huge. It's really magical. I often meet families in the, when they're first getting involved, and, you know, especially the younger, everybody's eyes are down, the kids, they're sort of, sort of off. And then when it's not COVID, we do these uh, quarterly where the, everybody, the family, the whole family, the whole, all the mentors get together, just, you know, potluck, you know, and they talk about their goals and they talk about their experiences and they just, over time, you just see everybody, it's like everybody's candle got lit. And in the beginning, you know, super shy, then more and more and more. And then you also are seeing every, all the mentors just beaming and uh, my favorite moment is is when the adults mentor really understands what it took for that mom or that dad or those parents 
to actually keep their family together through what they've gone through. And the family member, that house, those heads of household, those parents become the hero of the mentor. That is a transformative moment for everyone involved when they all of a sudden go, oh my God, I don't think I could have done that. Totally. You know, most people can't. You say that you currently help over 200 families, is that mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, about 700 individuals, yeah. Are there, are there any situations where you have to turn someone away or you, you run out of mentors or whatever it might be where you, you have someone coming to you for help, but you just, whether it be one reason or another, you can't help them? Like, is, is that an issue for you? Yeah, we have capacity. Like, I guess my question is, mm-hmm. like, aside from just capacity and the team members within your network, are there issues where um, someone is, is too mentally unstable or maybe it's drugs or maybe like they're, they're just like any other host of problems that would prevent you from embracing them into your organization? So in terms of, let's just say, the intersectionality and complexity of a family, the answer is no. We can, be, given our structure, we can handle anything. But the family needs to want to participate. We're not some kind of a mandatory program. Like, one of the things we've learned, and this may answer, help sort of put a little bit more around it, is when a family is still in shelter or transitional and not doesn't have a permanent place to live, they're still very heavily in a trauma-informed state. And once they actually have a place that they know they're going to live in for a while, then they're ready to have, think about this idea of a mentor, think about jobs. But until that, so our program is about helping families as they move into permanent housing or just after. So that's one The other thing is we also have done a little bit, especially during COVID, of working with families that were on the verge of losing their housing and trying to shore them up. But they already, but they have housing. So one thing is they've got to have housing, Mm -hmm. which goes back to our big... Right. Housing first, and then everything else can come secondary. So that's that. But again, the family needs to want to do this. And I think part of the reason we have so many single adults and many people with special needs kids and they are, or they have a history with domestic violence or stuff, they've learned that in order to keep their family together and to go, they need help. And when we're able to say, well, this is how we come alongside, you get to choose. You can choose mentors. You can choose this. We got these. We think... These are, but this is driven by you and your goals and your, then they succeed. If we were mandated in any way, I don't, I don't think it would work. When it comes to financing, how do you guys, do you guys raise capital? Do you have a gala? Do you have events? What is we your source? We do all of the above. Mm-hmm. Um, not, no galas the last two years sure. um, because of COVID. Um, we don't actually do a gala. We do something called Imagine Ball, which is probably the, it, it's an anti-rubber chicken dinner. Um, it's a it's a celebrity sort of concert comedian thing. In uh, one of our board members is John Terzian, who runs H Wood and a lot of really cool nightclubs. And we get one of his nightclubs, and he gets some amazing talent to come, like Dave Chappelle and Busta Rhymes, and we get to honor cool people like Serena Williams, and we raise a lot of money in a night um, and don't spend a lot of money. So we raise a net. But we grew up until we got some phenomenal government funding from DHS, Department of Health Services, who just basically gives us money to do our program. They don't and to report the way we report. All of our other funding is private, uh, whether it's individual donors or foundations. It ends up being about a third, a third, a third. And We're right now um, with our social benefit calculator and growing our economic mobility program. We're really looking at those being um, fee for service, um, which is really, I think, the future of sustainable modeling in in nonprofit. You got to create something that is of value 
that will generate income and not basically start from zero every year and raise money. It's it's just not otherwise the other is not is not sustainable. So that's where we're heading right now and and essentially our contract with Department of Health Services is a fee for service con- contract. So that's what we're doing and you know just like raising capital for a good entrepreneurial idea if you got a good one raising the money is not the end of the world. It's just something that you do. When you think about five years from now, Mm -hmm. how do you want your organization to look? Is it roughly the same or are there, like you talked about the the service contract, the DHS, are there other systems or programs like that that you'd like to see implemented? Or is it like we're on a good path and we just need to continue that path. It's almost like golf too, where it's like yeah. you want your <laughs> you want zero customers, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you you want to put yourself out of business. Yeah. yeah. I don't think in five years we'll put ourselves out of business. Yeah. But if I dare have a crystal ball, we've just gone through a strategic planning exercise with a really cool combo. Uh, the Center for Nonprofit Management plus McKinsey. So it's been really fun. Pretty next level. And What we're looking at is our overall model, which we call the family partnership model, which is this, the case management plus the mentorship plus the economic mobility that works with families. We're looking at growing that model both in the scattered site way and in the building way, and then licensing that model to other nonprofits. They can be in LA, they can be around the country. So not just growing it family by family, building by building here in LA, but actually, and we've done one called Imagine Whittier, and we'll be looking at at that. So both growing it as its own social service entity, but that can also train others to do our model. Then the economic mobility program itself, which is its own little pod, um, looking at scaling that. And I would love to think in, five years, I would love to think that we could get to hundreds of organizations utilizing that, both here and, and elsewhere, maybe more. I don't know. We're, we're piloting the scaling next year, so t- check in with me again. And then on the social benefit calculator, my hope is in the next 10 years to actually I mean, this is my personal dream, not necessarily just Imagine Lakes. My personal dream is to get our social benefit structure aligned to help families and people get out. I mean, truly go towards financial independence. And for our, our structure of the benefits to be both a safety net right now, people fall through too easily. They don't get caught. So that's part of homelessness, but they're also not propelled out. And so I'd like it to truly be a net and a springboard. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks yeah. for opening our eyes and our listeners' eyes on a, a different take, someone who's in the know. <laughs> thank you for your work, honestly. Um, thank, thank you for you. doing what you this do. This is fun. Yeah. I really fun. appreciate it. Do you want to it. tell everyone where they can find your organization? Yes. We are online at imaginela.org. And uh, there's information on everything we've talked about there. Thanks, Jill. Thank you, Jill. That was it. Our final episode of season three and our last one of 2021. We thank you for tuning in, whether this is your first episode or your 130th. This year saw us go from virtual recordings over Zoom to in-person conversations from our new studio in West Hollywood. We've learned a lot from our guests and we've grown as a team. We hope you've done the same. This is a perfect time to reflect and plan for what's to come next, and we've already set ambitious goals that we'd like to accomplish in 2022. We'll be back in January, but until then, have a happy holiday season, and thank you very much for listening.